to our tour of our exhibition. So I'm going to share my screen now. And so we're celebrating today the APS's founder by highlighting Franklin's life as we go through our virtual tour of our current exhibition, Dr. Franklin, Citizen Scientist. Benjamin Franklin was born on January 17th, 1706, and making him 316 years old this week. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty old and pretty great. Um, so after this tour, if you're feeling inspired and wanna go through it again by yourself, you can access this virtual tour uh, with the link that Mike should be putting in the chat now. And I'll also send out an email with the links mentioned in this program afterwards. Um, and yeah, Mike should be putting that in the tour now. Let's get into this. So when you think of Franklin, some names might come to mind, right? Statesman, diplomat, publisher, printer, citizen scientist, and natural philosopher. Franklin's thoughts and ideas shape not just our, our country politically, but also scientifically. Franklin explored how the world worked through experimentation and observation. He was, he was one of the first, in a sense, citizen scientists. And as a citizen scientist, uh, where he was self-educated, he gathered evidence both by himself and with others and shared that knowledge free, freely. Franklin believed that all people could contribute to useful knowledge to science and uh, help society for the better. In this same thought, Franklin founded the American Philosophical Society in 1743 to promote useful knowledge. Now, think about what that means. We like to say a lot of times that when we say useful knowledge, we don't mean just sitting in an armchair being like, I have a great idea and not doing anything with it. Uh, what we actually mean is uh, taking that idea, going out in society and having a positive impact. And this is what Franklin thought. He wanted to discover, generate, and disseminate information that would have an impact on society overall. Now think about what is, use, what is useful, useful knowledge to you and how you can continue this pursuit of useful knowledge today in your life. Now we've been saying Benjamin Franklin's name a lot, but uh, what, what do you think of when you think of him? Uh, I know when you say his name, an image always pops up, right? He's on our money, he's on our coins. Um, so let's take a look at some of the images other people uh, associated with him. So we're going to start with this etching right here on the left, uh, done by Marguerite Girard after Jean-Honoré Fragonard in 1778, called Eugénie de Franklin. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered that French. I really apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, and so we see Franklin here uh, cover, uh, protected by Minerva behind him. Uh, who's telling Mars to really strike down America's enemies. And next to Franklin, also being protected is America. Uh, so the symbolic, this figure of America. So really you can see here how the mythological figure of what people thought of Franklin in 1778, right? He, people associate him with electricity and lightning um, and he's a protector of America. Another image to think about is over here in the right, right, right top corner is Franklin in his, in his fur hat. So Franklin as the frontiersman, an image he also helped uh, promote, right? This, uh, this very manly frontiersman guy from America. So these are, these are some of the images uh, other people during the time associated with Franklin as a mythological figure as his frontiersman. But let's get to one of my favorite image portraits of Franklin. Some of you might have rec recognized this portrait right here. Um, so this is a copy of Benjamin Franklin made by Charles Wilson Peale. Uh, this portrait was made in 1785, and it's a copy uh, after David Martin's portrait, and it's, a, it's well known to Franklin. And so this was two copies made, uh, one was specifically given to the APS, and so if we look closer at the portrait, we see some clues as to how Franklin himself wanted to be perceived, right? Uh, you look at his clothing, he has some fine clothing uh, going on, uh, he might, uh, his powdered wig, might be associated with a, a gentleman scholar, a gentleman scientist, natural philosopher. He's holding some papers, right? Surrounded by papers and books. Maybe he's looking over some political tr treatise or maybe he's looking over some uh, science related papers. Um, he's, de he's definitely thinking um, and overlooking him. And if we take a little close up here is a bust of his idol, Sir Isaac Newton. So really this overall image helps promote that that uh, idea of Benjamin Franklin as a natural philosopher, as a thinker. Um, and what I also 
really enjoy about this portrait too is like a little bit of highlight of his hands, right? Um, I always imagine too, he wanted to highlight his hands because he worked with his hands throughout life and he was very proud of that, his work as a printer, um, as, a, as, a, as a working class man. And that made him to be able to be that financial independent uh, person that he was later in life. <clears throat> so, and this image also is a big change from when he was 17 years old and walked into Philadelphia. He came to Philadelphia with barely anything. Now look at this portrait. He's a well-off uh, well man surrounded by things he wants and, and looking into different scientific interests. And as we go through, we look, so we know in, in those portraits, we see Franklin as a mythological figure, a frontiersman, a politician, and of course, a natural philosopher. And what he couldn't promote in imagery, uh, maybe ideas maybe he couldn't be publicly associated with, he used uh, the power of printed word, which influenced his life from an early age. And so we'll also talk about um, throughout the exhibition too, maybe different pseudonyms he used. And you can see this image for yourself in our virtual tour and that link Mike posted before, or you can also see in our digital collection here and Mike's, uh, we'll put a link in the chat now. But you know, this is a uh, birthday tour, right? So if you're wondering what would be a good gift uh, for Franklin, I can tell you, it's a book. Uh, Franklin loved a good book as books were the gateway for him to learn. Franklin would go on to be a printer and print books by himself. Uh, and books not only allowed you to educate yourself in the 18th century, but they allowed the transfer of knowledge over wide areas. So we're gonna continue on in our exhibition here and stop at a book that was one of Franklin's personal copies. And this is uh, called, as you can see here, Philosophical Works by Robert Boyle. This was made in 1736. And Robert Boyle was a natural philosopher, someone who wanted to see how the world works through observation and experimentation. He was also the founder of the Royal Society of London, uh, a, a society that Franklin wanted to join and be recognized with. Uh, this personal copy of Boyle's book um, shows also the different interests that Franklin and natural philosophers uh, would look into, right? So if we see here, these are a couple of topics that they're, that they're going on about. Um, and these would be things that natural philosophers would investigate. And a couple of these topics, Franklin himself was interested in. Uh, but, you know, this is just one part of being a natural philosopher. Uh, you know, you have to research topics and learn about them. What about the practical side? So we have our, let's take a look at the next book we have here. All right, so this book is called Medicina Britannica. It's uh, from 1751, um, and it was written by Thomas Short uh, with a italicized commentary by John Bartram, and it was printed by Benjamin Franklin. And this book, uh, was, when it was written by Short, was used was to show how to use English plants in medicinal ways. Now, Bartram adapted this book and made it accessible to North American colonists. He did this by adding parts to show um, where you could find these English plants in North America and if there were substitutes for these plants, you couldn't find them here. And so this, it, the cool thing about, and just really fascinating thing about books' lives and their history, uh, when our curators were making the exhibition, um, they found this plant specimen in the book as they were going through it. So you can picture someone actually taking this book out to the field, trying to identify plants, trying to figure out what the plan is. Um, and they're taking this specimen and putting it inside the book and closing it up for later use. So that's, that's really the, the amazing thing about books, right? They have a, they have a very long history. Um, and you never know, maybe someone gave this book uh, to the original holder as a way to support them, right? To further their education. And birthdays are a reminder of the people who support you. In the 18th century, People who supported others financially with supplies or through access in general were called patrons. Benjamin Franklin gained much through patronage of others and was a generous patron himself. In the 1700s, natural scientists were able to focus on their studies and ventures through the generosity of wealthy patrons. And let's turn around, take a little zoomed in look here with our next object. And so this is a uh, Franklinia. This was made by uh, William Bartram, who's son of Franklin's friend, John Bartram. And he, William was supported by Franklin a lot throughout his life. And in return, uh, he was named 
uh, he named this uh, tree plant named uh, after Benjamin Franklin, Franklinia. And so in our exhibition, which is now closed, we actually had this little seed here. Uh, we actually had, a, we had real seeds uh, on display for kids to find, to see, and then try and find this object in our exhibition. And you can actually find Franklinia here in Philadelphia at Bartram's Garden in West Philly. All living Franklinias today are, are probably descendants from those cultivated at, John, at Bartram's Garden. And if you're in the area, there's also one on Independence Square next to Congress Hall. Um, another example of patronage is our book right here. Zoom in a little bit. Uh, this is the Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahamas, Bahamas Islands by Mark Catesby. And while the, the Franklinia was an example of, you know, uh, people who have succeeded under patronage naming something after their patron, this is an example of the support of patronage. Um, so Mark Catesby was funded by both colonists and Europeans to go throughout and document species he encountered in these areas. And since photography wasn't a thing, right, we don't have cameras back in the 1700s, um, he had to both, he had to be able to draw and document very well anything he encountered. So one of the things he encountered right here is our friend, the American bison. Um, but he also encountered um, inadvertently, accidentally, the Native American or indigenous uh, uh, process of controlled burning. And he, he documents it inadvertently because he, document, he, he draws this plant right here. But then he realizes, I want a physical specimen as well. And he goes to collect it. But by the time he comes back, he mentions in the book that it's been destroyed uh, by, by the native and indigenous people there through, through a burning. Now, controlled burning is a plant or controlled fire that is used to maintain a forest or land's health. So Catesby unintentionally mentions this, pro this practice. Uh, but generally, Catesby and other scientists ignore or dismiss Amer Native American and Indigenous people's contributions of useful knowledge. Um, this pra practice is still used today. Native and Indigenous people were contributors to useful knowledge and still do today. It's not just the wealthy white men uh, contributing scientifically. And there's a, lot, there's a vast number of contrib contributors um, throughout this time, but many of them go uncredited. And that, you know, that, that goes into what a lot of this exhibition is talking about, talking about Franklin, of course, but also his collaborators and some of those people who actually go undocumented. But as, as we're going through here, you might be like, all right, Allie, we know Franklin likes his books. Everyone's gonna get him a book. What other kind of gift can I get him? All right, I got you covered. Another gift you could give Franklin uh, would have to deal with printing, not a book, but maybe a typeset or a stencil, like these stencils here. And this one says uh, Franklin right here. He would love that. So that's another gift you could possibly get him. Uh, and as a printer, Franklin took his craft very seriously and was always looking for new kinds of types uh, to experiment with. So Franklin started working in printing at a young age. He was apprenticed to his brother James at the age of 12 in 1718. And this book we're gonna focus on right here, English Liberties, is an, is an interesting one because it was printed by James Franklin in Boston in 1721. And it's thought that Franklin, who would have been uh, around 15 at the time, uh, likely did the physical work of setting the type uh, for this book. Now, printing these books, of course, gave uh, Franklin a lot of ex uh, slow experience becoming a printer, but it also gave him access uh, to books in general on their various topics so he could read them. So while he might not be at school anymore, he can teach himself different concepts by reading the books that are being printed in his brother's uh, print shop. It was in this print shop that Franklin found his voice, although a masked one, in the voice of silence do good. At the age of 16, Franklin created under pseudonym of uh, silence do good, a, a series of letters. And do good was a, uh, a middle-aged widow. So it's quite the opposite of Franklin at the time. Uh, Franklin used this do-good persona to write into his brother's newspaper, New England Current, in order to get published. So he wasn't going to get published at his age, so he used this different pseudonym to, to open up that avenue. And her tone was very, like, tongue-in-cheek, uh, critiquing different ways in colonial life, but in a very fun and humorous way. 
And she was very popular and James would continue to print her letters. So you can imagine Benjamin at a young age, secretly at night, slipping letters under his brother's print shop door to get published under this other name. And uh, Silence Do Good would go on to have 14 letters uh, published. Um, and then soon enough, uh, that would end. And Franklin later on would leave for Philadelphia. Now, pseudonyms weren't a new thing, uh, but Franklin used them very well. Uh, pseudonyms were just a common device used by writers when writing letters to the editors, right? They want to hide their, their identity because maybe the idea they're trying to convey might not, uh, not, might not be popular, it might be outrageous, maybe it's illegal. Um, or they want to convey ideas without people connecting to their identity. And, you know, Franklin printed a variety of materials throughout his life. One of which, though, was currency. But like Franklin always does, when he makes something, it's uh, pretty unique. So let's take a look at uh, some examples of currency he made. So as you can see here, these are two examples of different kind of currencies that Franklin made with his uh, partner, David Hall. Um, and so Franklin really experimented with currency to, to make it safe from counterfeiting. Uh, and on these two pieces of money, uh, you can see leaves, right? Um, which is funny, right? Why would he use leaves? Um, and so Franklin observed that leaf patterns could not be easily reproduced by hand. And Franklin would put a leaf and put some uh, cloth backing on it as well. And he believed that this would make it much harder to counterfeit them because it would be very hard to really kind of do that by hand. Um, and this was useful when Franklin was designing new currency and making a counterfeit proof. So to have a stabilized country, you need to have money that's not being able to be counterfeit, needs to be stable. Um, and Franklin only shared this, this technique of printing money with his partner, David Hall, who you see also written here, or also maybe with apprentices who helped him with the process. Today, the government uses their own kind of tricks, right, uh, to make sure money is, is counterfeit proof. So watermarks, color changing ink, and more to stop people from creating fake money. Scholars didn't actually know the full process of this until just recently. Um, so it kind of shows how uh, intricate this process was for Franklin and how he also kept it very secret. So if you're interested in no, uh, if you know interested in designing your own currency, you know, kind of like Franklin's, uh, you know, feeling crafty with the family at home, Mike is putting it in a link now in our making money at home activity from our APS at home uh, tab. But of course, money is important, right? You need money to buy party supplies, right, for a birthday. Um, and if Franklin had a birthday party today, he might have had a nautical theme party um, since he was always interested in the sea and how it worked, different concepts with it. So let's turn around here to our uh, Gulf Stream map. So this, uh, Franklin had family members who were sailors um, and he, he used, he collaborated with them to use this sea knowledge and observations to help explain how certain phenomena worked like the Gulf Stream. So this is a Gulf Stream map from, uh, published in 1786 in the APS transactions. Uh, Franklin worked with his cousin, Timothy Folger to chart the Gulf Stream in 1768. Sailors had observed previously that the warm water current uh, made ships travel faster when they're traveling east and slower when they're traveling west. And so, Franklin and his cousin worked together to really map and chart out and describe how this current worked. And it was, uh, and they started that in 1768, and it was finally published in the transactions in 1786. Um, before this map was produced, many people just didn't understand the nature of currents. Um, but Franklin knew that this was just one of the examples of how everyday people can produce useful knowledge if we just stop and listen and provide access for them to share their information. Another thing Franklin was interested in besides the sea was maybe how to control it or calm it. So we're going to go over here to this cane. Um, so this is a, a cane that has a little pocket so you can put oil in it. Um, and so something like this uh, Franklin had after one of his experiments. So he was traveling across uh, one of his many travels and he notices a ship is sailing and there's calm water underneath it. And so he asks the captain, what's going on with that? How, why is there calm water around the ship? And the captain responds, it's probably because the kitchen dumped their oil 
uh, and that's causing the waves to be calmer on there. Franklin hears this and a couple other encounters and he decides, all right, I'm gonna go try it for myself. And so uh, one day he's walking around, he stops at a pond, realizes it's windy and choppy. And he's like, this is my perfect chance to try out this experiment I've heard about. And so he gets some oil and at first he puts it at the very, uh, at the very shoreline, right? But he notices the oil doesn't do anything because it keeps getting hit back to the shore uh, at this little pond. And so he takes the oil and puts it a little bit further out. And he notices that it's starting to, to spread slowly and, it, the, and the waves are calming a little bit. So Franklin gets excited by this, right? He's kind of he's making a hypothesis the first time it didn't work. So then he's like, okay, how can I change this? So he's trying to use a scientific method there. Um, and so from then on, he made sure to, when he had his cane, to have also a little oil reserve inside it. So when you're going out on a walk with him, uh, really every moment for Franklin was a time for education, even a simple walk. So he was always having that in hand. But, you know, you know, it's a birthday party, right? It's a birthday tour and birthday, birthdays are nothing but electrifying. Uh, I think you know where I'm going with this. The excitement of what's going to happen next is just like Franklin's uh, reaction when he was experimenting with electricity with his friends. Um, this is actually an electrical tube sent to uh, Franklin by uh, one of his patrons. And it came with, let's take a look, came with this book too. So this book told uh, Franklin and his friends how to actually use this glass tube for electrical experiments, so static electricity. So think of it like, if you're sitting around with friends, someone has a balloon and rub, rub uh, the balloon on your hair, you're generating static electricity. Same thing with the metal tube, with the uh, glass tube. And this started Franklin off in his investigations really into electricity and how it worked. And it would culminate into his first publication of uh, experiments and observations on electricity in seven, 1751. Uh, Franklin, like us, you're always, you're, you're fascinated with static electricity, you're like getting out of the car, accidentally shocking yourself. It's winter now, so everyone's taking off their hats and somehow you're shocking yourselves. Um, you wanna know how that happens. Um, and so Franklin uh, creates a series of, he, he does a series of experiments and he publishes them in this first edition, trying to, descri to, to describe how this all happens. And while people today for birthday parties might get a magician or have a party game, uh, Franklin and his friends would shock each other for entertainment and for science. Um, and so this uh, first edition, besides showing, giving different ways that other people could replicate Franklin's experiments, uh, allowed him also to become uh, known worldwide as this very well-respected scientist. And becoming a well-respected scientist also opened doors for him politically as so it, his uh, electrical experiments really helped him throughout his life. We know one of Franklin's famous electrical experiments is his kite and key experiment. It would, uh, and we would like to greatly emphasize that Franklin did not discover electricity. Uh, Franklin's, Franklin's experiments demonstrated a connection between lightning and electricity. So that's always something we like to highlight. We want to emphasize there. But besides, you know, using electricity for fun, he also wanted to educate the public on how to protect themselves from static electricity. So this is uh, one of Franklin's poor Richard Almanacs. Um, we're gonna focus on this little section here, where it's how to secure houses and et cetera from lightning. Um, and poor Richard, uh, full name, uh, Richard Saunders, was another pseudonym for Franklin, um, which, he wrote Poor Richard under. Um, Richard was supposedly an astronomer or a philosopher who made various predictions um, about all sorts of things in, in this almanac. And almanacs were used to predict a lot of different events. Um, they could be that everybody that everyday people could read. Um, these predictions included crops, weather, tides, eclipses, death, um, and all sorts of other occurrences that they were trying to predict. And everyday people could buy them and read them. And Franklin sold these at his shop as well. The first Poor Richard was published in 1732, and many of the witty phrases that we know Franklin by um, usually come from these almanacs. Um, and so Poor Richard's almanac got off to a popular start, right? How do, you, how do you get your almanac 
onto the stage and and let people know that it's actually really accurate, right? These are predictions. So how did Franklin do that? He literally killed off the competition. Um, in his first almanac, he predicted the death of his lead competitor, uh, Titan Leeds, supposedly. This is one of the Franklin stories. And he tells readers to get the second edition to see if it's right. <clears throat> in the second edition, we all know that Leeds is still alive, right? Franklin can't predict his death. Um, but in the second edition, he does claim that Leeds has, has passed away. And uh, this kind of brings up his popularity. And it's like, oh my God, he predicted his death. And the real Leeds tries to say, hey, I'm still alive. And poor Richard later says, oh, he's just a fake. He just took over Leeds' place after he passed away. Um, so it kind of does show, it does show the humor and the tongue in cheek of Franklin um, and really the gall that he can kill off his comp competitors to make his own almanac popular. And this, uh, this part of the almanac about securing houses was talking about the lightning rod and trying to help, help people understand how to protect themselves from lightning and secure their houses. Um, but what is static electricity? Um, so we're gonna go over here to our battery. Um, static electricity is the buildup of electrical charges on the surface of objects. So if you have a buildup of, of electrons on your hair or clothes, you know, uh, which are insulated, uh, which are insulators, and they're still there when you come in contact with like a conductor, like maybe a metal doorknob. It's going to create that pathway to the electrons to flow and, and create that spark. And that leads into our Leiden jar right here. Um, when uh, a Leiden jar was used by Franklin and many people at the time to hold static charge. Um, so Mike should have a link uh, as well that should show like a device that would help charge up these Leiden jars. Remember, you have to use friction. Um, and so causing that friction, you funnel it to the, the Leiden jars and they hold that, that charge until you, cre you create a conductor that allows that charge to come back out. And so one Leiden, one Leiden jar creates a little spark. What happens if you create this battery of Leiden jars all together that are all connected? You're gonna be like, what, how do you do that? So you're gonna create a bigger spark by connecting all these, all these Leiden jars together. Um, and supposedly, Franklin uh, used, this bat used this battery of lion jars to create a, uh, to cook a turkey to make it, and it's supposedly the most tender turkey he ever had. It's one of those Franklin stories, you can take it or leave it, but supposedly he used a uh, static charge to actually cook a turkey. So that's always fun. <laughs> um, but as we move on, the next couple of people we're gonna talk about would have been pretty important people to Franklin. And, especially during his birthday, they would, have been, they would have been in attendance. So just as Franklin um, would not be alone for his birthday, he wasn't alone in his scientific endeavors. Um, as he had help from his friends, um, his family and his household, and, and possibly even the enslaved people in his household too. So we're gonna move on to our next object, which is here. Um, and so this is a, a, the only, known surviving portrait of Deborah Reed Franklin. Now, Deborah Franklin was pretty much uh, Benjamin's partner in life, both in marriage and business. When Franklin left for overseas, Deborah took care of the business, uh, took care of making sure people paid them back loans, kept, uh, also kept an eye on the mail system, uh, kept, Frank, uh, kept Benjamin informed of things at home, sent him specimens and letters from colleagues, and even defended their home from an angry mob during the Stamp Act riots. So she was a pretty busy woman. And without her, Franklin would not have been able to accomplish all the other things in his life because she was helping him, making sure the financials were taken care of, the business was taken care of, and also uh, sending over scientific communication. And she was a scientific contributor as well. Um, and we know from a letter that he sent, that Franklin, that Benjamin sent Deborah that uh, she was also encountering his experiments at home when he was away. And so we don't have Deborah's letter, but we have uh, Benjamin's letter uh, responding to her, telling her how to silence the bells in their house. Um, now, why is that? You might ask, why is that a problem? Why, why, are the bells ring why are there bells ringing in their house in general? Well, Frank, well Benjamin had a experiment in his house uh, where his lightning rod on the top of his house was connected to the Leiden jars down below. Remember, Leiden jars hold a static charge. They store it. And those Leiden jars were also connected to bells. So whenever 
the line jars held the static charge, the bells would ring. And I guess Deborah was not very uh, happy with the ringing of the bells. She wanted to know how to silence them. So Franklin writes back in a letter on June 10th, 1758, um, which you can see that, uh, that full letter in our digital archive, Mike is putting in the link now. Um, and Franklin describes how to silence the bells, um, but he also warns Deborah that even though the bells are silenced, doesn't uh, doesn't mean uh, she uh, doesn't mean that they're not still charged. So the line jars are still charged, the bells are silenced, so you still need to be careful around some of this equipment. Um, and besides like communicating with Deborah overseas, Franklin always communicated with his younger sister, uh, Jane Meekham. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna change over here real quick. And so this letter is one of four letters uh, from Jane Meekham to uh, four pages from Jane Meekham to Benjamin Franklin. And like I mentioned, Jane is Franklin's sister, his youngest, probably his, and his favorite too. And Jane's writing to, Benjamin about uh, uh, the family soap recipe and how to do it. Um, and so the Franklin family had a famous family crown soap recipe made by one of their older brothers, and it was called crown soap due to the, the, the crown that was stamped onto it after it was done. And Jane would sell the, this soap to help herself financially with her own income, and uh, Benjamin and Deborah would also sell this soap in their store for her as well. Now, this re recipe uh, Jane sent consisted of four pages, like I said, and it had very in-depth instructions. On the final page, you can see at the bottom here, uh, Franklin drew these little uh, uh, illustrated uh, steps of making soap. So it's a very complicated process. And Benjamin himself had trouble actually making this soap. So, so much that even though he asked for her to write the letters, he's trying it. Eventually he just asks if she can just send him soap because um, he actually wants to give it out to his friends in France. Because so it does show that, um, you know, there's this scientific communication and conversations happening between Franklin and other members of his household. And at one point, Jane says to Franklin, uh, to Benjamin, that there's a good deal of philosophy in the working of, of crown soap. And when she means philosophy, like natural philosophy, natural science, or science in general. Um, so if you'd like to see the full four pages and try and read it and make, maybe uh, see, how, see the process yourself, uh, Mike is putting in the link for that in our chat as well into our digital archive for all pages. All right. So our last uh, member we're going to talk about today is... Uh, Sally uh, Franklin. So Sally was uh, Benjamin's daughter. Uh, this was the image you see on your screen right now are the APS minutes from 1787. Um, and in the APS minutes, they say that Sally's the hostess for the APS meeting at the Franklin household. And so before Philosophical Hall was built in 1789 for the American Philosophical Society, uh, meetings were held, uh, meetings and events were held at various members' houses or different venues. And so this does show too that silence wasn't uh, science was not private, and it crossed paths in the public and private sector. So Sally would have been privy to uh, the meeting and what was going on. And she also had tried her hand too at um, making the family soap recipe as well. So she was in that conversation with her aunt and her father about the family soap recipes. And so you know they certainly would know what kind of gifts to get. Franklin, because, you know, birthdays make a lot of people happy because of the gifts they receive. Um, but to get presents for your birthday, you need to be, uh, you need to be able, you need to be a good person, you need to do good things to get your gifts. And this is seen in Franklin's work as a citizen scientist, and as a founder of many institutions uh, that exist today, like the University of Pennsylvania, and of course, APS. Um, this here is just one example of uh, so this is a proposal relating to the education of youth in Philadelphia in 1749. And so Franklin believed that uh, it was important for society and men in general uh, to be educated. And so remember, it's only men, though, at this point. So however, the, the pathway education is limited. 
Um, this really starts what would later be University of Pennsylvania. As we turn around here and look in this crate and in this one, this is uh, the trip. This is uh, showing the transit of Venus or documenting the transit of Venus, which was a, uh, the, the eclipse of Venus across the sun in 1769. And this was an international effort. So it wasn't just the US documenting the transit of Venus in 1769. Everyone was working together to document it because afterwards uh, it was said, if you measured the duration of the transit, uh, it could lead them for the first time to calculate the size of the solar system. And they got pretty close. Uh, and that's pretty impressive for not having calculators back then. Um, but this, uh, this would later be printed uh, at this point because David Rittenhouse, who would later be, he was a mathematician, astronomer, a clockmaker. He was later president of APS, was one of the scientists leading the effort, uh, one of the efforts. Uh, so one was at his farm. There was another team in Philadelphia measuring the durations and another one in Delaware. But these calculations and results would later uh, be put into um, the APS transactions, the first one, which is actually the oldest running, oldest continuously running scholarly press in the US. Um, and with their publication of the results, uh, it made uh, the European scientists really look at to American scientists with respect and also put the APS um, on the map internationally for helping with this international effort. Now, while we are celebrating Franklin's birthday and contributions, uh, it's also important to note the role he played in the system of slavery. We're gonna go to our reflective moment right here. Um, and so Joseph, Jemima, Peter, King, Othello, George, Bob and Jack were enslaved by Benjamin Franklin and his family. Uh, some were sold uh, to Franklin and others were given as payment. While there's no uh, concrete evidence of enslaved people as part of the scientific endeavors of Franklin, they must have had a hand in helping him with, with equipment and experiments in general. So it's always important to think about these scientific endeavors. And while they highlight important figures, think of those who go unmentioned at times and who go uncredited. And besides being part of the system of enslavement, uh, Franklin was also interested in the study into human difference. And so enslaved people were put on display for scientific institutions own study into human difference, which we today now recognize as very unethical and wrong. Franklin himself was interested in this so much that Deborah, so we'll go over at this one, uh, Deborah sent uh, went to an exhibition of an enslaved child who has now what we know as albinism um, and sent and managed to get a, a sample of his hair and send it to Franklin himself when he was in London. And it's written up in, in one of these books here. And while Franklin's view of slavery does change and change over time, it doesn't excuse his actions um, in the system of oppression. Now, this is also one of the instances too about Franklin's changing of opinion. He, one of his last pseudonyms he uses and also one of his last published works under a different name um, happens on March 23rd, 1790. Uh, his, Historicus, under the name Historicus, uh, where he responds to a speech that was given in Congress uh, where a politician defends the slave trade. And then Franklin writes an article that compares that speech given by the Georgia representative and a hypothetical speech given by Al, an Algerian slave owner. Um, and Franklin uses these two people to debate, to show the hypocrisy of American slavery practice. Um, and so while Franklin does change his mind over time, it still doesn't excuse his own, his own part in all of this process. That's always something to think about. But as we get to the end of our tour, we do wanna end this on uh, Franklin's favorite sister, Jane Meekum and what this exhibition kind of is centered a lot around, right? So this is a letter from Jane Meekum, Franklin's sister to Benjamin Franklin in 1786, which is both later on in their lives. Like I mentioned, Jane was Franklin's younger sister. He was very close with her. They talked about a lot of things. They talked about politics, science, family, even philosophy, but they each had different paths in life. Jane was married to a, a husband who pretty much didn't support her or the family. 
leaving Jane to do much of the money making. Um, and this was a problem where Jane would go on to have 12 children that she would have to take care of, as well as later on taking care of grandchildren, and other family members. But this doesn't stop her from talking about structural inequality and access to basic things that we consider today, like education. And so in this letter, Jane says, thousands of Boyles, Clarks, and Newtons have probably been lost to, lost to the world and live and died in ignorance and meanness, made for want of being placed in favorable situations and enjoying proper advantages. Very few we know is able to beat through all impediments and arrive to any great degree of superiority and understanding. Benjamin Franklin was able to take advantage of the opportunities presented to him as a white man. Um, but how, how many Benjamin Franklins and Jane Meekums have we lost today because they were not afforded equal access to basic necessities? Think about who gets remembered and who, uh, and who doesn't get remembered um, and make it now our jobs moving forward uh, to push those people out of the shadows and have their stories being told. And so I think this is a great gift for Franklin on his birthday by focusing not just on his legacy, but the legacy of others, especially his sister, and that everyone can contribute to useful knowledge and look how far we've come today. So I wanna thank you all for coming to our program today. We have, looks like we have some time uh, for some questions, chats, and my, I'll stop sharing my screen right now. All right, what are some questions? Um, Pop back up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's see if I captured them all accurately. Um, so, so the first question popped up in the chat, I believe, and not the Q&A, but uh, is Franklin's birthday that you mentioned, I fit up. <laughs> uh, did you use the old style or the new style dating? I'm guessing it's new style dating. Yeah, I think we, we tend to run with, uh, at least in the APS land, um, with the January 17th date instead of the January, yeah. what is it, 6th uh, maybe? Maybe, um, yeah. Date uh, is what we tend to run off of. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. It wasn't the, the, uh, always a fun question. Uh, that one always gets me. <laughs> <laughs> um, please remember that if you do have a question, feel free to drop it into the Q&A or to use the uh, chat function and we'll try to pull it from there. Um, ooh, uh, uh, what about the tooth? <laughs> what about <laughs> uh, so let's see here. Hold on, share screen. Oh, I'm trying to main page. So if we go here, you can't really see it too close right now. Um, but right here is it. Franklin's tooth. Uh, encapsulated in like a gold uh, a gold acorn. Um, its provenance is very is very good, but it's supposedly, I think I think what it is is that it was in Franklin's will and it was given either to his son-in-law, it was left to his son-in-law or something like that. And then it travels down the Franklin line. So it is supposedly Franklin's tooth. Um, and it was just handed down in the Franklin line. There we go. Yeah. Mike put the link in the chat. Power of virtual, I can just quickly find those <laughs> links. It's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next question up had to deal with the uh, the Boyle book. Um, did Franklin understand Newton and Boyle's science and math in detail? How much math did he know? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Because I feel, uh, I guess we never really think about how much math Franklin knew, right? Like we know about the science, so but I'm not sure how much math he knew, but I also he had, he had to have helped with, hmm. I'm not sure, that's a great question. There had to been some math involved, um, yeah, that, uh, but that you never be, really think too much about that part, I feel like. Yeah, um, I, like we know he played those mathematical games, like the magic squares, he had to do yeah. some. Yeah, um, and bookkeep, bookkeeping too. Bookkeeping, yeah, bookkeeping. Yeah. So I don't know outside of like arithmetic and simple equations how much he went into. Um, yeah. So that's a fun question. Yeah, yeah cuz while he helped structure the transit of Venus, I don't he wasn't doing like the complicated math that like David right. Rittenhouse was doing. Right. Um, uh, were American bison found in the southeast in Bahama Islands so for the Catesby book? Uh they would have probably been found Carolinas. They were, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was a gland that ended up becoming um, because it depends on like the borders and everything. Land, yeah, like open woodlands, yeah. they would have been found in, in the Carolinas. Um, their mm -hmm. habitat stretched pretty far. Yeah. 
That's the next one. Uh, does Franklin have any living descendants today? Uh, yeah, I think there's like East Coast, West Coast Franklins. But I don't know if they have the last name Franklin anymore, but there are living descendants of Franklin today. Yeah, yeah, Franklin, Beige, um, a couple of other last names get scattered in there. Mm -hmm. uh, did Frank, you'll love this one. Uh, did Franklin actually fly a kite in a storm? <laughs> Um, he did have a, he did have a kite out there, but he was, he protected himself to make sure he was undercover. And really all he was doing was trying to see if it would get that static charge. So it wasn't struck by lightning, um, or he would have died. Um, so that's, that's a great question. Um, so he did, he did fly a kite, but it was like, uh, it had other instruments attached to it, like, uh, a key, um, a certain, like a velvet, uh, tail as well. Um, but he did not, he was not fully out. He was, he was safely in like a house at that time too. So, and he did not get struck by that. Yeah. Um, yeah you, if you, uh, if you also look into the tour, there's, uh, oh, what's his name? The history of electricity, which is in the electricity section mm -hmm. is that book is like one of the first times that Franklin gets uh, like published. He, uh, I think it was Priestley. Uh, Priestley yeah. publishes an account of Franklin's kite experiment, and it goes into detail with that. You can zoom in. If you use your little mouse wheel, you can zoom into a lot of objects and read them. Yeah. Um, it also answers a different question, but um, maybe able to get a decent, pre uh, decent view either on our digital library or the, yeah. there's a catalog uh, that you can download for free of the exhibition that might have more details or kind of a better views of some of the objects that we discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you answered this a little bit in the in the final sections, but uh, do we have a number of how many people the, the Franklins did enslave? Uh, I think the, the ones we definitely know, I think there was like around maybe eight or so confirmed. Um, there's, uh, what's the article? What's the that by? Um, Oh, the one by Gary Nash? Yeah, the one by Gary Nash. Uh, there's an article where he goes in depth about the Franklins and, and slavery. Um, but yeah, what we know is we know like eight, like around eight for sure. Um, but there, you know, there could be things that got lost and haven't been, haven't come to light yet. Right. Uh, okay, so, um, so Franklin, uh, Ben and his marriage to, marriage to, to Deb um right because that's a little bit more complicated than just a straightforward marriage Can you explain that a little bit <laughs> yeah uh so benjamin and deborah's marriage was a common law marriage so deborah reed franklin was originally deborah reed roger franklin or roger sorry um so she married a man named john rogers when franklin after franklin had left for london they were supposed to be engaged but he left for london didn't come back for a while she became married to John Rogers, where he was not a great man at all. Um, and so later on, they would separate and he would go off to somewhere and no one knew what happened to him. So even if Deborah wanted a divorce, she could never get it because no one actually knew what happened to him. And so Franklin and Deborah couldn't officially get married, um, but they had like a common law marriage because there were laws like if should John Rogers have had ever come back, there were very... Um, serious laws about uh, uh, marrying another man when you're marrying another person while you're still married. Um, so they had that common law marriage and pretty much everyone, they were husband and wife. So. Okay. I think that, that, that hit all of them. It's on fire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. And thank you. Um, where was that one? Okay, cool. Uh, oh, do you know what material the cane had for the oil uh, for the oil can? I think it's bamboo. No, oh, they, they actually, I think it might be ivory, actually. But I, 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 I want to say ivory off the top of my head. Does it say on the thing? It should. Yeah. But uh, look up another question and I'll yeah. confirm that. Uh, this is here, uh, or you can respond to this one and I'll, I'll grab that. Um, what themes do kids respond to in the exhibition and with Franklin in general? Um, and do we have any suggestions on books or digital resources? Okay, well, one, the material is bamboo, staghorn, or bone and metal. So it might probably be staghorn and bone then. For the, uh, what do the kids 
I've had, it's, it's always an interesting topic about what interests kids. So um, sometimes it's the, sometimes it's the bust of Franklin you see at the beginning because it's so lifelike. So kids find that interesting to actually see what he looks like and kind of examine him. Um, other ones are, which one would they be? Uh, we used to also have, we used to have this uh, interaction where we had a scorpion uh, beetle and the Franklinia seeds. And we had examples of them real life, uh, which were taxidermy, the, be the uh, scorpion beetle was taxidermy. And we challenged kids to actually find these in the exhibition. Cause, yep, there's the Franklinia seeds. And so they were, that one and, and the beetle, there was drawings of them inside the exhibition. And that way was to get the kids to really look at the objects um, in the exhibition. I, it seems like they were, that really seemed to engage them while they were there too. The money is always a popular one because it's very graphic and pretty. Um, so kids like that one too. And of course the tooth, if they see it's a tooth, yes. they go crazy over the tooth. <laughs> uh, and then uh, books, there are honestly probably too many, especially for, um, for kids. Uh, yeah. But digital resources, I'll do an APS plug, uh, the virtual tour that Allie used for, for this program. Um, when you go to the main screen for the virtual tour, there are two options. One is a youth track, and that is all kind of uh, written for, targeted at um, kids around the kind of like eighth grade level um, and a little bit younger. Okay. Oh, the, uh, the battery of line jars is a big one too. Yeah, Ooh, okay. Uh, how old was Franklin in the Peel portrait? So that would have been... Now we have to use math. I know, that's tricky. Um, and then in the image in the fur hat, um, the one in particular that we have, on that medallion, I can't remember. Well, the image in the fur hat could have been... Let's see. That was made in 1777. Okay. That's the Nini medallion. Um, so it would have been a good bit older than that one. So, in the, no, that's not it. and then the Peel one was in, I think, 1786, I said. So he would have been older in that one. But Peel likes to. Uh, he, he was a little bit more with like making sure he looked a little bit better. So, mm -hmm. yeah, most of the images that we see of him are like usually middle aged and up. There's only really one or two of him. As but a, then, a but also, it's a copy of David Martin, yeah. which he had while he was in London. So he would have been younger when it was first taken. So, um, a couple of questions about Franklin's actual birthday celebration, some happenings, which is really fun. Um, so, uh, was giving an actual practice for birthdays at the time. Uh, and then what do you think Franklin would have eaten for his birthday supper? <laughs> I feel like I need the art of eating in front of me right now to make the, yeah. what he would eat for supper. Maybe a turkey, because he, he was always a proponent of the turkey. Uh, that's always a good choice for Franklin. Uh, uh, but did they celebrate birthdays? I, I feel like, yeah, they would, they would celebrate birthday. Probably not in the same way that we, we all would, but... Yeah. They would have celebrated birthdays. Yeah. Like I think the song "Happy Birthday" was written for like another hundred years or so after Franklin's. Yeah, I'm sure there's. That. They would sing their own songs and all that. So, <laughs> but I would say turkey for the food. Yes. Um, a colleague just reminded me that we do have a whole series on uh, Franklin's art of eating, um, and in the blog. So I just shared that link into the chat as well um, for that question. Okay, so it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, make sure that we didn't miss anything at the end. Uh, okay, uh, because it's a timely question, especially given the world right now. Um, uh, so what was Franklin's perspectives on his son and the, and the vac vaccination for, or the inoculation really for smallpox? His, what was his perspective on his son? Um, like Francis or is, are we talking about yeah, Francis? Yeah, I'm going to assume it's Francis, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Franken believed in inoculations. Um, there is a ending book in the exhibition. Uh, just before Jane Meekham's last letter, there is a book talking, show, uh, Franklin talking about inoculations. So he was a big proponent for it. I think the story with 
Francis and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the story with Francis was he was sick at the time, so he could never get the inoculation. And then he became sick with smallpox and that's when he passed away. So I think it always went back. A lot of people like to blame Deborah, I believe, but that's not true either. Um, but it was thought that Franklin was, Francis was sickly um, and he never was able to get the inoculation at, the time, at that time, but he was a proponent of an inoculations. Yeah, and particularly after uh, Frankie's death. Yeah. Um, that's a good switch there. Okay, so it is two o'clock officially. Um, please know that we have all, all of the questions <laughs> noted um, in that list of uh, links that we shared along the, along the way. We'll try to answer some of these questions as best as we can um, as a kind of compiled resource for everybody to, to reference as they go through the virtual tour themselves. Celebrate Franklin's birthday um, a little bit later on. Um, just to make sure that you have as many resources as possible to uh, in four days celebrate the real thing kind of <laughs> uh, and yeah. we'll see. Um, so right. thank you so much for joining us and thank you to Allie for leading the tour. Yes, thanks everyone for coming out today. Hope you have a great day and see the other program later tonight. Great. Bye.